wanting in uh, put their mobile phone. and witnesses participating remotely. Can I remind members, please, although you're experts at this by now, and the witnesses, just to watch for your microphone switching on before you start to speak, so we don't miss anything that you're about to say. So the first item on the agenda this morning is a declaration of interest. And I'd like to invite the new member of the committee, Jamie Halcrow Johnson, to, to declare any relevant interest. Jamie, good morning. Good morning, convener. Thank you very much indeed, and happy new year to everyone. Um, can I just can I just declare that I'm a member? Please ignore all messages. This is a test of the fire alarm. Please ignore all messages until further notice. Okay. Um, while the, the while the fire alarm is on, if we can mute Jamie, I'll come back to him um, while those uh, Tannoy announcements are going on, I'm and just say that. Well. Jamie, if I could just say, before I cue you back in, uh, I'd also like just to, at this stage, to say thank you very much to Oliver Mundell for his time on the committee. He uh, played an important part in the committee and uh, attended, I think, just about every meeting that he was able to. And on that basis, and that the Tannoy announcements have told you it is only a practice fire alarm, Jamie, uh, would you like to declare your interest? Very quickly, um, I am a partner in the farming business of J. Halker Johnson and Sons, and I also own agricultural land in Albany. And I think those are the uh, interests that will be most relevant to this committee. Thank, thank you very much, Jamie. And we will now move on to agenda item two, which is rail services. Uh, this is an evidence session on the rail services with witnesses from Abellio Scott Rail and Network Rail. This forms part of a series of regular updates the committee receives to allow it to monitor the rail network and rail services performances issues. The committee last heard evidence from Abellio Scott Rail at its meeting on the 10th of June 2020, when it considered the impact of COVID-19 on transport in Scotland. The committee will discuss the recent rail services operations and performance including the continued impact of COVID-19 and rail franchise issues. Uh, I'd like to welcome from Scott Rail, Alex Hines, the Managing Director uh, of Scotland's Railway, David Simpson, the Operation Director of Scott Rail, and Liam Sumter, the Chief Operating Officer of Network Rail Scotland. Alex, uh, good morning to you, and I wonder if you'd like to make a brief opening statement. Alex. Uh, good morning. Thank you, convener, and thank you for inviting Scotland's Railway, that's the partnership between ScotRail and Network Rail Scotland, to participate in this morning's session. Like almost every aspect of our lives, coronavirus has changed our railway fundamentally, and right now our passenger numbers are down by 90% compared to the same time last year. During these tough times, the priority of our staff has been on keeping key workers like nurses and carers, as well as vital freight, moving safely and reliably across the country. Since March, Scotland's Railway has broken the mould to ensure that we're supporting the country in these most difficult and unprecedented times. And I want to thank the thousands of staff across Scotland's Railway who have done an outstanding job of delivering and managing that change. Pre-pandemic, the railway wasn't exactly famous for its ability to implement change at speed, but during the pandemic, we've repeatedly acted quickly to deliver the service needed to meet the times. We've reduced the number of services we operated during the first lockdown and then steadily increased them again as restrictions were eased and then reintroduced. And with the latest restrictions, we are once again reviewing our timetable to ensure we better match capacity with demand and provide value for money for the taxpayer. And we will, of course, share any of those changes with the committee. And all of this has been achieved through partnership working with colleagues from across the industry, including Transport Scotland, the Trade Unions, British Transport Police and Transport Focus. Since I last appeared before the committee, we have also had to deal with the tragic derailment at Stonehaven in August. The date of the 12th of August 2020 will be seared into the memories of many of us forever, 
and we continue to mourn the loss of train driver Brett McCulloch, conductor Donald Dinney and passenger Christopher Stutchbury. And there are a number of investigations into what happened and we await the outcome of these. Network Rail has already in, instigated two expert-led reviews into how we better manage the effects of climate change on our railway to reduce the chances of anything like this ever happening again. As the good news on vaccines continues, we are working hard to be ready to welcome more customers back when restrictions are eased, and customers are going to have different demands compared to before the pandemic. So whether it's new ticket types, different timetables, smarter ways of delivering improvement works or better technology, we know that reform of the railway is needed to match the transformed expectations of potential customers and the economic reality. And the pressure on the public finances will also mean that all parts of the rail industry, the operators, network rail, government, the supply chain, trade unions and others will need to work much harder to deliver a more cost effective railway. We do not underestimate these challenges ahead, but the work that we do, whether that's investing in our people, growing our economy, connecting communities, should never be underestimated. And now, more so than ever, we are ready to play our part in the economic recovery and make the case for continued investment in Scotland's railway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, before we go on to uh, questions, and there are quite a few of them, uh, I think there is a declaration of interest that I'd like to take at this stage uh, from Stuart Stevenson. Stuart, would you like to make your declaration of interest, please? Uh, thank you, convener. I, I just declare that I'm the honorary president of the Scottish Association for Public Transport and Honorary Vice President of Rail Future uh, UK. Uh, and uh, just to abuse my privilege very slightly, convener, uh, can I just uh, say how much uh, I regret the, uh, the deaths and the accident uh, in, in the northeast of Scotland on the railway, particularly as uh, Donald Dinney was someone I regularly met and who brightened uh, every journey that uh, he was the the, 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 they are serving uh, customers. He was not alone, but he will, will be missed. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Sir, and, I, and I'm sure your your views are echo the thoughts of the committee uh, on that issue. So I'd like to turn to our first question, yeah. uh, if I may, which is from Peter Chapman. Peter. Uh, thank you, uh, convener, and uh, good morning to the, our uh, panel. Can I also just start by saying something about the, the, the desperate bad accident at the just south of Stenhaven? And it's very much in my patch as well. And uh, you know, it was an absolute disaster, and there was loss of life. The only positive that, 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 that we can find within that uh, disaster is the fact that there were only a handful of people on that train on that day. I shudder to think what the loss of life might have been if it had been a normal day in a normal uh, train uh, with uh, many, many more people aboard than, than was actually on that day, on that train that day. Um, it was a tragedy, and it could have been so much worse. But anyway, that said, um, my first question is, uh, Alex, in your in your introduction, you you obviously said that uh, you know passenger numbers are down. 90%, you said. I mean, the figure we have, I think, was 80%, but uh, it's maybe even worse than that. And you've had to adjust your uh, your timetables to to suit that. Uh, obviously, that much lower uh, footfall. Um, but my question is, given this the new level of lockdown again, and maybe even more severe uh, restrictions coming in today, we don't know that yet, but that's a possibility. What are your plans to adjust timetables going forward from here, eh, Alex, at this, at this point? Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, so our approach going forward will be the same that we've uh, used since March of last year. So twice a week, ScotRail, Network Rail Scotland and Transport Scotland get together and review what's happening with demand. And it does change literally on a daily basis, and you can directly correlate the number of passengers travelling with the health restrictions which are in force at any time. And so, prior to uh, well, after lockdown one, we had recovered to 
back to 30% of normal demand. And clearly, as lockdown restrictions have been tightened uh, after Boxing Day, uh, customers have, have left the railway again. So we're now operating about 10% of uh, we're operating about 80 percent of services I should say for about 10 percent of the customers um, we don't think that's very sensible so we are actively looking at operating shorter trains uh, where possible and we're also uh, uh, looking at timetable reductions there under active consideration um, clearly we want to make sure that we're uh, being a good and efficient operator and we're saving the taxpayers money but we also need to make sure we're providing enough seats for the customers that we are seeing about 30,000 every day and allow those customers uh, space for physical distancing so it's a really delicate balance which we're reviewing on a daily basis but I think it's likely that in the coming weeks we will reduce the length of trains and indeed the timetable because uh, of these latest restrictions, which no one is expecting to be released soon. Hmm. I mean, I, I, I just just to follow up on that a wee bit. When you do look at the timetable, is there an opportunity for the, the travelling customer to, to be involved in that? Because although there's only ten percent on, on the train, you know it, that train could be vital for that person to get to, to get to their work or to get to do what they need to do. Yeah. And and you you obviously need to cut services to, to, to make the thing look reasonably sensible but you also need to remember that there are there are the people on the train that absolutely rely on that service and you need to deliver a service that, that fits their lifestyle yeah. if you can you, you are absolutely right those people who are currently using rail services in Scotland are those people who absolutely need to travel so whether they're stacking shelves in a supermarket or caring for people in the healthcare sector and often these people are shift workers as well. So our mm. approach has been to make sure that we operate a service uh, across the whole network. Uh, where possible, we protected uh, early and late trains, recognising the shift working nature of a lot of essential uh, jobs. And every time we change the timetable, clearly we look carefully at the demand we're seeing, but we also go and consult with the regional transport partnerships to make sure we've picked up any uh, local aspects. And um, we've recently been able to consult with NHS boards, for example. And because we are um, operating at less than our full capacity, um, and because there are relatively few customers traveling, we've been uh, able to respond to specific feedback from customers or an employer uh, or indeed a parliamentarian saying, could you just tweak this timetable for us to better match how people are using the rail services? And we've been able to do that. And this is where, you know, listening to our staff, who of course are our eyes and ears out there on the network, but also making sure that every day we're trawling through all the feedback we get on social media and using that intelligence to tweak the timetable has been a really uh, really important tool in our armoury to help manage this pandemic. Okay, thank you. I think that's me, uh, convener. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. Um, I've got a couple of questions, if I may, for you, uh, Alex. It's just to, first of all, do you think the uh, emergency measures agreement is working well um, and, and, and the provisos within that? So that's a general question, then I want to drill into costs a bit, if I may, as well. So, Alex. Yes. I think the emergency measures agreement is working well. I think Transport Scotland stepped in swiftly and decisively to uh, provide additional funding for the rail industry to make sure that services could still run in an environment where, at the height of lockdown one, revenue collapsed by 95%. So I think that is one aspect of uh, the pandemic working, which has worked effectively. Okay, um, um, and, and you, you mentioned there. Uh, actually, the additional cost. So, um, I think that, uh, as I understand it, there's been uh, a about four hundred and sixty-nine million pounds the extra cost. But that's on top of the original, the already uh, factored-in cost. So, what is the actual cost of operating the railways now, as we're doing? How much is that going to cost a year uh, with the current? Uh, agreements that are in place. 
Well, it depends on what happens to revenue, and that is changing every day. And there's no fixed profile for subsidy at the moment. Essentially, if revenue falls, uh, the taxpayer injects more money into the rail industry in Scotland to account for that shortfall to keep services running. So, um, if you take take the economics of the railway in Scotland, where the rail network, that's both Scott Rail and Network Rail, costs broadly about a billion pounds a year, and Scott Rail's fare box revenue in a typical year is about £350 million per year, and that falls by 90%. We're talking additional funding in the region of hundreds of millions of pounds. We try and reduce that call on taxpayer funding by, as I've said, looking at our costs in terms of the services we run, the length of trains, the number of services, but uh, the nature of the rail industry is that most of our costs are fixed because it's infrastructure, rolling stock, staff, for example. So it is a very considerable sum of money in the hundreds of millions of pounds. So, so just to, to put to make this entirely clear, so I understand it, is that if passenger levels stay at the current levels they are at the moment, it, it could be costing uh, about 1.3 billion pounds a year to, to run the railways as they are functioning at the moment, on the basis that you said that there are very limited savings that you can make uh, to the fixed costs? Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think we should be that specific about numbers, but yes, hundreds of millions of extra funding has had to be made available, to keep services running, um, and that, you know, changes on a daily and a weekly period. So, a significant amount of money. Uh, our priority is to make sure that we're being a good and efficient operator to make sure the taxpayer is getting value for money and of course we're delivering for those people who absolutely need to use the network which are at the moment are you know essential workers and and how long do you think uh uh the EMAs will will need additional financial support is that until passenger numbers get back to where they were before or or is there a shorter time scale well, the honest answer is that nobody knows, because nobody knows how passenger demand will recover, rebound, emerge post-pandemic. Um, so, um, at the moment, uh, we're doing some scenario planning as to how we uh, expect demand to recover. Clearly, once we get the final green light from the public health authorities, we will be out there marketing and promoting our product as much as we possibly can to get uh, as many passengers back on our network as we possibly can, because that is the best way to reduce the cost to the taxpayer. The honest answer is no one knows. So the best example is commuting. Um, so, you know, roughly a third of uh, our traffic is commuting. Um, will we go back to pre-pandemic levels of commuting? I don't think so. Um, you know, there is some evidence to suggest that commuting for office workers essentially will become a discretionary activity and we need to think about how we change our business accordingly but I think that's one of the things that we are going to have to do is to be able to respond to the new market demand rather than just put back what was there before. And, and I think we're going to come on to that later. I, I think one of my colleagues has got questions on that. I think uh, Mike Rumbles wanted to come in uh, with a question at this stage. Uh, Mike. Go on, say something, Mike. No, you were right to wait. Mike, are you on an Apple machine? Um, if you're on an Apple machine, unmute yourself because you, I think you muted. You've muted ah, yourself. Yeah. You can hear me. I, I can. Thank goodness. Uh, Mike, your question. Thank you, convener. Um, just to follow on from the convener's question to Alex. Uh, and I know, Alex, you may not have the figures yet because we're early into 20. 21, but I think it's really important if you could write to the convener, perhaps from, for the committee, could you tell us, so that we have a handle on this, how much 
what the actual figure of funding you received from the Scottish Government during 2020 was and compared to how much you received in 2019. I think that information for the committee would be extremely helpful. Yeah. As each emergency measures agreement concludes, we will work with Transport Scotland to write to the committee to confirm exactly the funding received in that period. Happy to do that. Thank you very much. I think it would be helpful for the committee when we consider our budget scrutiny if we have a handle on what we think it's going to cost the railways to run for the forthcoming year. It just helps us to look at the budget. On that basis, I'm going to go to the next question, which is from Richard Lyle. Richard, good morning. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Alex. Alex, you actually touched on the question I was going to ask you. Compared to last year, passenger numbers have fallen by 80 to 90 percent, as you said. Likely, a national lockdown that began on the 5th of January will continually reduce passenger numbers from levels seen in November and December. As stated, there has been a dramatic fall in passenger numbers since March, which will severely reduce your income. I mean severely reduce your income. What action needs to be taken by the Scottish Government and ScotRail and the rail industry once the pandemic is over? Hopefully, who knows when it will be, but when it is over, to encourage people back to return to rail travel and is work ongoing in this issue at this moment in time? Yes. Thank you, Richard. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is that we very much look forward to getting the final green light from the public health authorities, because there is little point us going out at the moment to encourage more usage of the network, because it is against the public health restrictions. And even when restrictions are eased, there is a chance they might get tightened again. And so, you know, bluntly, we would be wasting money. So, the vaccination programme is very welcome, and we look forward to getting the final green light. We are going to go hell for leather to recover our revenue as fast as we possibly can when we get that green light. And we also need to look at new and emerging markets. So, everybody is expecting leisure to bounce back more quickly than commuting and business, for example. So, we are working on some plans to encourage leisure, particularly 2021 might be a year where staycations are popular because of international travel restrictions. And so, you know, we have been working away in the background, recreating an intercity network for Scotland, for example, with our new upgraded high-speed trains. We have been working away on our active travel carriages for the West Highland Line to make our leisure product more attractive to the market. We are also looking at some exciting ticketing technology to make it even easier to buy from us than it is already. And we are also clearly working through some scenarios around how commuting might rebound or not, as the case may be, and what does that mean for our timetable. So, we are operating in this environment where we have got a high degree of uncertainty. Nobody really knows what the future holds, but we need to scenario plan and be ready to respond quickly so we can do the very best possible job for our passengers and the taxpayer. Yes, I agree with you. I actually think train travel is one of the most exciting things that you could do, and I am looking forward to that when I retire, hopefully in the next number of months. But one of the things I want to ask you about is, and I was a bit concerned when you said earlier, shorter trains. The main line runs through my constituency, Glasgow to Edinburgh. Generally, I see three or five carriages on a particular train. If I was during this COVID situation, I would prefer for you to leave the train the size it is rather than shorten it, but then I would be able to ensure social distancing. So, why do you want to shorten your trains? I can understand because of cost, but for a passenger point of view, I would much prefer a longer train than a shorter one. Yes, I completely understand that, and we have been looking at this really carefully. So, the rail network in Scotland is currently a one-metre-plus physical distancing 
um, uh, and the plus being face coverings being mandatory on stations and trains for those that can uh, wear them. But in our timetable planning uh, work, we're assuming two metre physical distance to be uh, to be generous, essentially. And we look very carefully at the levels of customers travelling. Um, if we, we make calculations to say we need to give every customer travelling two, two metre physical distancing and we size the train on that basis. So we would only shorten train services if the number of people travelling were able to physically distance at two metres. Right. Okay, that's fine. That explains it. That's me, convener. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, the next questions are from John Finney. Good morning, John. Hey, good morning, convener. Good morning, uh, Mr. Hines and, and panel. As you'll have worked out, convener, the question I plan to ask has been well and truly thrashed around thus far. But uh, maybe can I push you a little bit on the future demand issue? Are you able to say anything about any, uh, when you talk about modelling, are there any? Um, techniques you can share with us, how you would assess that. I know it might just appear a finger in the wind sort of approach, but are there any um, lessons that can be learnt from uh, other occasions regarding uh, modelling for future demand? And maybe just to roll two questions into one, um, is the modelling that you are looking at based on um, an assumption of no contraction with regard to the number of routes? And therefore, can you give some assurances regarding future staffing levels, please? Mm. So, yes. Yeah, so, if you take models to predict rail demand uh, and revenue, they're all based on past historical relationships. And so, there is a question mark about how useful those models are in terms of predicting the future. And we're pretty sure that coronavirus has changed lots of things and we won't go back to pre-pandemic. I think it would be naive to assume that um, all our passengers we used to carry will come back straight away. So there's a big health warning on any of the modelling we do because it's based on history rather than what's happened in the last 10 months. But essentially the way we go about scenario planning is breaking down the rail market into three primary uh, purposes of travel. So that's commuting, business and leisure. And then based on the research we're getting from our own customer panel, the demand that we're seeing in our daily revenue numbers, the research Transport Focus is doing, uh, the research we're getting from business organisations like the Confederation of British Industry, we then are able to produce some high, medium and low scenarios for each of those markets. So I'll give you an example. The Confederation of British Industry is expecting uh, office workers, which is a big part of our commuting market, to divide their time between home and the office evenly, evenly. So maybe travelling into the office two, three times a week. And clearly that will have an impact on, for example, the type of ticket they want to buy. So we're trying to anticipate those trends so that when we're ready to go again, and recover this revenue. We're providing products and services and timetables which are relevant to um, the new markets, which inevitably will have changed. And then, in terms of um, you know the future, you know we're looking at the whole network being open. Nobody's talking about closing bits of the rail network in Scotland. You know, pre-pandemic. The popularity of the railway in Scotland had never been higher. We were growing, we were growing strongly. Customer satisfaction on the rail network in Scotland has never been higher. We've got ambitious plans to decarbonise the rail network in Scotland. And indeed, if we're going to decarbonise Scotland, we're going to get we're going to have to deliver modal shift uh, onto rail. And so I see uh, railways being you know, at the heart of our post-pandemic recovery, but we don't ever take for granted, um, you know, patronage or indeed the taxpayers' support that we're recovering. We need to um, be ready to respond to these new markets that inevitably we will see emerge, hopefully this year. 
Okay, thank you very much indeed for that, Mr. Hines. Uh, that's me. Thank you, Camina. Thank you very much, John. Um, Stuart Stevenson, I think you'd like to come in at this stage with some questions. Stuart. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. And I want to uh, uh, just explore the impact uh, on the staff uh, who, who work for ScotRail, uh, and, and indeed to the extent that uh, it may be possible for you to uh, make comments um, in related industries that are not directly in your employment. So there, there, there are staff, I know, that are employed in subcontract. So if you've comments. Uh, on them, it would be useful. And, and basically, one of the challenges that, uh, as a public-facing uh, bit of your staff in particular, will have faced, as is true in retail, and uh, is public compliance with the measures that will protect the health of everyone: face masks, social distancing, and so on and so forth. I hear that uh, compliance on the rail network has been comparatively good, perhaps better than some other areas. Uh, but how are, how are staff coping, and what sort of support are you able to give them? Because the stress levels for staff will undoubtedly have have mm. risen um, because of the physical mm. environment, and also just worries about the, the, the whole their personal future as well. So some mm. some comments on staff, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you know, clearly in an environment where you know, 95% of our customers uh, vanished pretty quickly and we still had to operate the service. You know, throwing our arms around our people was our number one priority. And the first thing we had to do uh, when coronavirus first hit was to make sure that the production of the railway was made COVID secure. So whether that was driving a train, controlling a train, signaling a train, maintaining a train, all of these environments, every setting had to be made COVID secure. So we did things like suspend driver training because it's not possible to physically distance in a cab. We suspended hospitality. So, uh, and we diverted those hospitality staff into train cleaning, which we've trebled since coronavirus hit. And if you take our control center, you know, we fitted Perspex Speed perspex screens between each of the um, uh, workstations and introduced you know, temperature checking to make sure that we uh, kept our premises and the production of the railway and our people as safe as possible. Um, but of course, whilst lots of people were working from home, you know, it was our people out there on the front line delivering this vital public service and completely human. Uh, reaction is they were nervous because, of course, you know, back in March, we didn't actually know much about this virus at all. So the rail industry in Britain very quickly established something called the Rail Industry Coronavirus Forum, which is where uh, the rail industry and the four trade unions at general secretary level have been uh, working up the principles of how we're going to work. And here in Scotland, we've had our own rail recovery task force, and we have a subgroup of that task force, which is specifically aimed at partnership working, where the four trade unions have worked with us to navigate all these issues. Um, and so whether that's re-risk assessing all our activity, putting in measures to you know, provide hand sanitizer, or you know, the, the, the hundreds of measures we've had to make across uh, our network, both in Network Rail and in Scott Rail, to, con to make sure we continue to run a railway has been a big part of our work and it continues to do so. So, you know, we meet the trade unions twice a week to work through to work all this stuff through. Um, David Simpson, who's the operations director of Scott Rail, um, you know, chairs these meetings. I don't know, David, whether you want to come in at this point and provide some more detail. Yeah, thanks, Alex, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just to support what Alex said, involving the trade unions in all these discussions on how the industry responded to coronavirus has been a key feature. Uh, we've spoken to them throughout the pandemic. Uh, we've taken their views on board. Uh, we followed the guidelines yeah. issued nationally by the Rail Industry Coronavirus Forum, but also adapted those where necessary to reflect the environment in Scotland. Um, I think that's been very effective in establishing a two-way flow communication so we could make sure colleagues and trade unions and their members were aware of what was going on, but also receive feedback, which enabled us to adjust uh, how we were responding. 
uh, as well as possible. Uh, that has worked in terms of the timetable too, because we have taken intelligence from the staff who work the trains on demand, on peaks and troughs and so forth, and use that information too to make sure that what we do in terms of adjusting timetables uh, is suitable for the for the customers there. Uh, we've also significantly increased the level of communication uh, from ScotRail and Network Rail to our frontline staff, so they know what's going on. They receive the latest guidelines. They can provide feedback. And finally, we've made sure they've got the appropriate PPE to keep their activities safe, both on board the trains and stations, and also in restrooms and, and backroom offices. Uh, we've been very, very kind of. Uh, focused on making sure that physical distancing can be uh, established and that our staff are kept safe uh, between breaks, between duty, and working on the train as well. So I think that partnership approach with the trade unions would be very effective in having a very positive uh, relationship uh, to, to work through the pandemic, and that will continue to be the case as we navigate the next few weeks and months. Okay, I'm going to go back to Stuart right. Stevenson for a follow up there if you want to, Stuart. Yeah. Just, just a very brief one, uh, Convener. Uh, I think that's pretty comprehensive. Um, as MSPs, we receive regular reports from passenger focus on the view of uh, the travelling public, or perhaps one might say the non-travelling public. Um, and I just wonder, because I'm sure you will see what passenger focus are also saying, uh, whether the views of the, the, the experience of your staff in relation to uh, travellers accords with what passenger focus. Uh, is saying, or whether there are any particular insights that come uh, from that other uh, axis of communication between your staff and the customers. Yeah, I mean, transport focus are part of our rail recovery task force, so their insight and their research is helping shape our plans. And what uh, transport focus tell us is that those people who are travelling are very satisfied with the service that they're delivering. And their considerations are primarily around uh, space for physical distancing, uh, compliance with face coverings, uh, and also cleanliness. And you know, they, they are the things which matter to our people as well. And so we've been working really hard on all of those things. Um, we have two customer service centres in Scotland, one at Paisley and one at Dunfermline. We have a network of 6,500 cameras across the network um, and you know every uh, well twice a day I receive a report uh, where we're tracking customer numbers we're tracking uh, compliance with face coverings uh, we report on any alleged um, compromises of physical distancing and each and every one of those gets followed up to make sure we're providing as safe a network for our staff and customers as is possible. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alex. I think, Stuart, that's concluded your question. So we're going to move on to uh, the Deputy Convener, Maureen. Maureen, good morning. Good morning, Convener, uh, Committee and Panel. Uh, before I start my questions, can I uh, just congratulate Scott Rail on uh, the National Railway Heritage Award um, that you received for uh, the work done on uh, Stirling Station? That's the class. Well done. Um, so, can I ask whether you can provide an update on the implementation of actions set out in the two Scott Rail remedial plans and the impact that that's had on performance? Clearly, you know it's been disrupted by uh, COVID. But do you think you know this improved performance can be maintained when significant passenger numbers return? Um, and what impact um, on station dwell times and on time performance that will have? Uh, well, firstly, thank you, Maureen. Uh, we were really pleased to receive that award, and Got Rail and Network Rail work really hard on heritage. Uh, in fact, we've just recently established a heritage board for Scotland's railway, recognising um, the interest uh, in rail heritage as we continue to modernise our, our network. So, in terms of the remedial plan, uh, you're absolutely right. We had to improve train service performance and, indeed, customer satisfaction. Uh, we put £22 million uh, of investment into those areas, and I'm pleased to say that both on customer satisfaction and on train service performance, we have delivered some uh, great results. Um, so, pre-pandemic, 
uh, performance was improving, customer satisfaction was improving, and those trends have continued during the pandemic, and we're working hard to make sure that they are sustainable. So I'll give you an example. On the National Rail Passenger Survey, uh, we delivered in the spring of last year a result of 90% customer satisfaction. Uh, that's the highest um, it's ever been on Scotland's railway. We have hit 90% in the past, but it's never been higher than 90%. So we're at record customer satisfaction, which is good to see. And in terms of train service performance, where we measure our punctuality based on the public performance measure, we have a target in the franchise agreement and indeed, uh, Network Rail has a target through the regulatory settlement of 92.5%. And um, we're just a whisker away of, uh, of delivering that. Uh, so we're at 92.0%. So we're nearly there. And you know, the cynics will say, well, the operating conditions are very favorable. You're not operating very many services and you don't have very many passengers. Well, the trains and the infrastructure don't know that there's a pandemic on. Uh, and we've done lots of great work uh, around rolling stock reliability, train crew availability, infrastructure uh, uh, reliability, particularly the management of seasons, uh, summer, uh, winter, autumn. And we've also just introduced in recent weeks a new timetable um, in the North Electrics area of Glasgow, uh, exploiting the investment we made uh, in a platform uh, arrangement at Mulgai, where we invested £5 million. It's enabled us to restructure our timetable, uh, and we've delivered a huge boost in punctuality. So we've not been sat here just managing the pandemic. We've been working really hard to make sure that when customers return to the network, the quality of service is the best it possibly can be, because, of course, we're going to need to do that to get customer numbers back. So whether that's upgrading our Class 380 trains in Glasgow, the high-speed trains, completing the refurbishment of Glasgow Queen Street Station, the redevelopment of Aberdeen Station, the redevelopment of Motherwell Station, we are continuing to invest record amounts in the rail network to make sure we can provide the very best service to our customers. And just on those performance indicators, um, I know that there's, there are league tables in terms of Scott Rail's performance in relation to other train companies in the rest of the UK. Have you got? Do you have these figures to hand in terms of passenger satisfaction and performance? Yes. Yeah, so we are the, the of the big operators of the large operators in GB. We have the best punctuality and we have the highest customer satisfaction. Um, but nor are we complacent. Uh, we want to keep driving up train series performance. We want to keep driving up customer satisfaction. So we're proud of our record, uh, but we know we need to do more. Okay, thanks. Um, and my next question: I wondered if you could provide an update on the rollout of the refurbished high-speed trains on the routes between Aberdeen, Inverness, and Glasgow, Edinburgh. Um, are these now in service, uh, and are there, or are there still unrefurbished trains continuing to run? So the good news is that all of the high-speed trains which are in operation have been upgraded. Uh, we actually removed the unrefurbished high-speed trains uh, last year, May from memory. Um, so if you take an intercity journey between the seven cities in Scotland now, the chances are that you will get an upgraded high-speed train, and customers love them. Uh, we've now, um, the, the, the refurbishment of all 25 trains is now complete, and what we're going to do in the course of the next few weeks and months is start adding a fifth carriage to some of those trains. So not only have we upgraded the quality uh, of service, but we're also increasing the number of seats. And this is going to be really important as we try and get the leisure market back, hopefully this year, um, because um, you will know from personal experience, I'm sure, Maureen, that uh, at certain peak travel times, uh, historically, the trains between the Central Belt uh, and the Northeast and the Highlands have been quite popular, and we need more capacity 
and these trains have been upgraded in a way which are really good for Scotland. So we've lined the seats up with the windows, we've created huge areas for luggage storage, and so it's a much more pleasant experience, a genuine intercity level quality for our seven cities service. So that's all been happening during the pandemic. Of course, lots of people haven't experienced that yet, but when we're able to welcome customers back to the network, they'll see a much better service. And just my final question, convener. Um, obviously, the uh, service between uh, Aberdeen and Inverness and Glasgow Edinburgh has gone to two hourly instead of one hourly. Is it a bit chicken and egg in terms of when it will go back one hourly, uh, or have you got an agreement um, with the Scottish Government on terms of when passenger numbers reach X, you will put it back on to one hourly, or how does it work? Well, it depends primarily on two things. One is what are the public health restrictions in force at the time, and of course, at the moment, uh, it's essential travel only, uh, and you should not leave your local authority area. So that, of course, suppresses the rail market hugely. Uh, and secondly, it's the demand that we're seeing. So you're absolutely right. There is a bit of circularity there. And that's why we review it twice a week. Got Rail, Network Rail and Transport Scotland are literally reviewing this uh, on a twice weekly basis to make sure we're constantly, you know, dialing up or dialing down our service so it's appropriate and we deliver the best service which balances uh, passenger demand, uh, the call on the taxpayer, um, and also the need not to encourage uh, uh, non-essential travel. Uh, or unduly expose our people to the virus. So it's a delicate balancing act. It's one which we think we've got uh, broadly right since March last year, but we need to continue to do that because actually the you know the most challenging bits of this pandemic might yet still you know uh, be in the future, uh, particularly given the you know the new strain of the virus which we're very alive to. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Maureen. The next question then is going to come from uh, Colin Smith, and I think I may have ignored an earlier request to, to uh, allow you in on a, on a question. I'm sure you'll build it into these questions, Colin. So, Colin, over to you. Thank you very much, Convener. I'll do my best to pivot um, back to that particular issue. But uh, for, for the time being, can I turn to um, the future of, of, of the franchise system itself? Um, it was clear before the start of the pandemic that the current franchising system was very much finished, and um, even its most ardent supporter, the UK government, had established that the Williams Review to consider alternatives. Uh, unfortunately, that review is a wee bit like the Holy Grail. We think it might be out there, but none of us have actually seen it. There were hints that we may see some type of concessionary scheme uh, replace franchising, but whether the current level of risk has scared the government off that, we don't know. So, can I ask the panel if, if they have any idea? at all what the possible structure options may be in any future UK government white paper and how is this impacting on planning for the future within Network Rail and indeed Scott Rail? Alex. So um well Scott Rail and Network Rail Scotland uh you know continue to work in deep partnership through the Alliance. That's something uh we've done for uh six years or so now uh, and actually I think we're working more closely together than we than we ever have done before. Um, you're quite right. Uh, the UK government commissioned a review into the rail industry structure uh, a while back now. We haven't seen the output of that. Uh, I think Chris Heaton Harris, who's the rail minister at Westminster, uh, declared in December that he was hoping to see it published in the next six weeks. Uh, that's uh, by the end of January. Whether we do or not, uh, we don't know. We know that uh, Transport Scotland have an aspiration for uh, a single organisation, publicly controlled to run the railway in Scotland. Um, that's clearly a conversation between Scottish Government and UK Government. Uh, and you know, we're looking forward to seeing uh, the white paper, if and when it's published as well. Um, we're continuing to uh, operate the current service uh, well. Uh, on the basis of being a good and efficient operator, uh, and even though the franchise 
uh, might end at the end of March next year, or even because Network Rail funding might only be secure until 2024. We are working on medium and long-term plans for the rail network. So whether that's decarbonisation uh, of the network by 2035, uh, whether it's projects like uh, reopening the railway into Levenmouth, um, we're sort of ploughing on, uh, you know, regardless of what conversations might be happening uh, around the structure of the rail industry in the UK and indeed Scotland. So, so just to be clear, is it your anticipation um, that um, the current process of EMAs will simply continue uh, until uh, the current um, Abilo Scott Rail franchise ends in March 2022? Is that effectively the nature of your discussions with the government? We know that, that the government uh, in Scotland rejected the model that has been adopted in Wales, where they will um, take transport for Wales into to public ownership via uh, an operator of last resort from next month. Um, but is it your view that the EMAs in Scotland will simply continue uh, until at least March 2022? It's my expectation uh, that EMAs will continue until the end of March 2022. Yes, uh, the current EMA runs to the end of March this year, so we have a 12-month EMA to negotiate. So uh, clearly, uh, that needs to be uh, negotiated, but that is my expectation: is that will be a further emergency measures agreement after the current one to take us to what would have been the end of the Abellio ScotRail franchise. No, the, the Scottish government obviously um, published a, a draft franchise and policy statement recently, state, uh, starting the process effectively um, for the next ScotRail franchise uh, under the current structure. I mean, do you think? If that structure is continuing at the moment, which seems to be the case, is there sufficient time to complete such a process, given that, that the current franchise is scheduled to come to an end in over a year? I mean, is there any evidence at all, for example, that there's any private companies out there likely to want to bid for such a franchise, um, or is it possible the government may, it may extend the existing franchise? So the answer is we don't know what will happen after the end of March 2022. Uh, because even though the current law requires uh, franchising authorities to run a competition for uh, passenger rail services, uh, neither UK government or Scottish government actually want to do that. Um, so we're in this curious position, and that's why seeing the white paper will be really important. Hopefully we'll see it soon so we can plan for the future. Um, the honest answer is we don't know what will happen after the 1st of April uh, 2022, because we haven't seen the white paper. And can I just, with your indulgence, can we go back to the, the point I was going to raise earlier, which was um, just, first of all, echoing one of the comments that, that Alec made in his opening remarks, thanking uh, all our rail workers, uh, indeed our transport workers, for the, the, the amazing job they're doing, keeping Scotland moving uh, in the face of the, the, the pandemic. We could ask if it's possible to give us an update to the committee on where current discussions are regarding the pay of rail workers. As you know, um, uh, last year's pay discussions, even before the pandemic, were put on hold, uh, never mind the current ones, uh, and there was no provision within the EMAs for any pay uplift. So uh, has ScotRail been given permission by the government to restart negotiations uh, over, over pay, and, and where are we with any of those discussions? So the short answer to your question is yes. Uh, Transport Scotland have now allowed ScotRail to enter into discussions on pay. As we were talking about earlier on, in order to maintain rail services during the pandemic, uh, the government's had to inject a very large sum of money into the rail industry in, in Scotland. And so clearly affordability is a big issue. So um, the position of Scottish Government is that is there an opportunity for a pay rise to be funded through efficiency or productivity? And uh, in the coming weeks and months, uh, we'll be having those conversations with Transport Scotland and the trade unions to see what the art of the possible is. Our people have done an outstanding job, um, and uh, you know we like to see them rewarded for it. But just to be clear, there's no funds within any of the EMAs at the moment for to, to fund any any pay changes. Uh, no, there isn't. Um, so, you know, the, the level of taxpayer support which is being injected into the business has already 
meant that we uh, haven't had to make any redundancies. We haven't furloughed a single person. And so the money which has already been provided by the government has delivered job security for our staff, uh, which of course we're very grateful for. And the view is that any pay rise uh, should be funded through efficiency and or productivity. Uh, and uh, that those discussions will happen to see what's possible. Colin, so, okay, thanks very much, Colin. Just before we move on, can I just clarify something in my mind there, Alex? Can I just confirm that you said it is to the Scottish Government or Transport Scotland that will have to approve any pay rise? So you will just go back to them with, with what's been suggested, but it, it's up to Transport Scotland to sign it off. You don't have authority to sign it off. Is that right? Under the terms of the Emergency Measures Agreement, um, either ScotRails or indeed those across Britain, uh, the operators are not permitted to make any changes to terms and conditions without consent of the franchising authority, which in this case is Transport Scotland. So the simple answer is yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Emma Harper, yours are the next questions. Morning, Emma. Good morning, convener. Good morning, everybody. And uh, good morning to our witnesses as well. Um, I'm sure that uh, the challenges of the pandemic and travel and lockdown is the number one priority right now. And uh, progressing future real plans such as decarbonisation, which Alex mentioned earlier, um, those plans are probably being interrupted, I would imagine. But our um, Transport Scotland uh, document is already uh, uh, planning for decarbonisation. And uh, I know that rail is already a low form of uh, like carbon emitting transport because of passenger and, and freight travel. So I'm interested in, in the decarbonisation plan. I know that our uh, map that we have in front of us is a, a colourful map of proposal for electrification and other alternatives such as hydrogen and battery power. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you can uh, maybe describe the progress of decarbonisation and uh, and whether that will be delivered by 2025, uh, 2035. Actually, um, it seems quite ambitious, and whether the, the costs been uh, further outlined because uh, it's not actually in the the decarb action plan. But I'm wondering basically what's the progress and have costs been. Uh, um, I, I guess, decided. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so, yes, in July of this year, Scottish Government published the Decarbonise Action Plan for Rail Services, which said we wanted to decarbonise the rail network in Scotland by 2035, which is brilliant. And since then, we've been working between ScotRail, Network Rail and Transport Scotland to develop our plans uh, accordingly. We're starting from a really good place here. 75% of uh, journeys made on ScotRail are already on electric trains. Uh, so the vast majority of our network is uh, decarbonised already. But clearly, we need to uh, move to a position of net zero. Uh, we're going to do that through a combination of looking at battery electric trains, hydrogen and uh, classic electrification of the network. And uh, one of the things we've been doing with the Scottish Government recently is reviewing our uh, what we call our pipeline of rail enhancements. So, in a typical year, uh, Scottish Government might spend £200 million uh, upgrading the rail network. We are expecting that to increase to help fund decarbonisation. What we're trying to do is create what we're calling a rolling programme of decarbonisation, where we all know exactly what we're doing for the next 14 years, because by doing that, we can actually drive down the unit cost of decarbonisation. So I'll give you an example. On electrification, we think that if we were able to have uh, visibility uh, for the next you know, 5, 10, 14 years on electrification, we might be able to get 25 or 30 per cent out of the unit cost of electrification. 
So uh, what we're trying to do is make sure we're working smarter so that we can um, deliver more decarbonisation for a fixed sum of money. So it's, it's under development is the uh, honest answer to your question. Uh, and those discussions between ScotRail, Network Rail and Transport Scotland are intensifying because, as you rightly point out, railway turns 14 years uh, away is not very far away, but it is completely uh, it's completely doable. Thank you. Um, I think Emma's having problems with her link. Um, Emma, are you, are you there? Emma, you're back. Um, sorry, I, did, I don't know if you heard that answer. Um, um, did you I hear? I completely the missed the. Uh, sorry, you seem to have frozen um, again, Emma. Convener, I completely missed the whole of Alex's answer. Okay, well, I'm, I'm afraid I'm just due sorry, to the limitations um, of time. I... Emma, due to the limitations of time, I, I'm afraid I can't go back to that answer. Um, what I'll try and do is give you a moment to sort out your uh, connection and, and try and bring you in at the end. Uh, so on, on that basis, uh, I think I'm going to move to the next question, which is from John Finney. Um, John, if you're ready for your question, um, could we go with you, please, John? Yes, certainly. Thank you, uh, Convener. Mr. Hines, further about the real decarbonisation. Um, there are a lot of challenges. The biggest challenge the planet faces, of course, is the climate emergency. So, unlike Emma, I, I don't think it's uh, ambitious. I would like to see that target for decarbonisation brought forward to 2030. Um, but th th that's not uh, for yourself, of course, Mr. Hines. Can I ask about you? You rightly identify that there's been welcome progress made with electrification. I suppose the challenge would come in the area that I am uh, one of the representatives of in, in the West Highlands. So, if you think the Far North Line, the, the West Highland Line, the Kyle Line, um, and the suggestion there is um, that, uh, that it be alternative traction by 2035. I wonder. Can you maybe outline what would need to happen to make that reality? How would you respond to the, the suggestion? Um, um, and also, if you could maybe outline some of the costs, that would be helpful too. But also the suggestion that um, any cost-benefit analysis would say that the, the cost of doing this would be um, disproportionate compared to the amount of carbon emissions created by your existing diesel fleet. Now, that's clearly not a position I would follow. But I wonder if you could comment on that, please, Mr. Well, clearly, um, it's a government objective to decarbonise by 2035. Uh, that is going to require some funding, uh, but we already receive a lot of funding anyway. Um, in respect of the Far North Line, the Kyle Line, West Highland Line, we've identified hydrogen as being an option to decarbonise those lines because uh, classic electrification tends to work well where the rail service is, is relatively intense. Um, and the, bus the business case for putting the wires up is much harder on those bits of the network where the train service is, is less intense. And a number of us from ScotRail and Network Rail Scotland actually went out to Germany um, uh, pre-pandemic to look at the Alstom hydrogen train, which is in passenger services already, uh, in Germany to work out uh, what experience they'd had operating hydrogen trains. And one of the things we're thinking about is how can we introduce hydrogen trains onto those bits of the network? What would the distribution uh, network have to look like for the hydrogen which needs to be stored? How do the comparative operating costs between diesel and hydrogen compare? Because what we don't want to do, if at all possible, is to uh, put a hydrogen train in to replace a diesel train, which is much more expensive to operate, and it just increases the subsidy. But at the same time, we also need to think about the attractiveness of the product. So, you know, the trains, the trains on those routes will become life expired by about 2035. So we have the opportunity to put a brand new train in there 
which is much more attractive to customers who earn more revenue. But the other thing we need to think about is these are our scenic lines. These are our gems in brand Scotland. And if you look around the world, people are prepared to pay top dollar for fantastic scenic experiences. So if we're going to buy a new train for those bits of the network, let's make it really good to exploit the scenic nature of that market. And so, you know, I talked earlier on about us having to adapt in this post-pandemic world to exploit new markets. This could be one example of it. So we are looking at hydrogen. We're looking at experience of operating hydrogen. Um, we need to work hard on the business case, both on cost and on revenue, so we can actually uh, deliver this. We obviously have got COP26 this year here in Glasgow, and uh, in November, we will be showcasing uh, hydrogen battery trains uh, to show the public and those people who are attending the conference uh, what new technologies are available in order to decarbonize. So I think what you'll see is much more classic electrification with some hybrid battery electric technology and some uh, hydrogen and uh, those things will come together to deliver the decarbonisation by 2035. Um, th John. Thank you very much. For, yeah, thank you, Kabina. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Hines. Um, uh, green hydrogen from renewable resources is a limited resource that is needed in parts of the economy where there are no alternatives in battery trains. Um, that can charge when there are overhead wires um, might be a better option is, is something that is in a, a document that uh, Mike Park produced recently there. I would be very concerned if this was a binary choice that is being considered, either the status quo or, or hydrogen. C can you give, give an assurance that there is an open, open mind about what might be evolving other technologies as well, um, and not put yeah. all your eggs in the hydrogen basket, please? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we 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 are we are technology agnostic. Uh, obviously, tried and tested technologies uh, come with lower risk. So, uh, you know, we're more likely to favour classic electrification over other options. Um, but if you take the Far North Line example, there might be a hybrid option whereby we electrify between Inverness and Tame, for example. And we don't electrify north of Tain. Um, and one of the challenges we're facing is we're having to make decisions for the next 15 years based on technology, which is rapidly evolving. Uh, so I was meeting with a, a, a rolling stock um, supplier last week who uh, is claiming they can produce a hydrogen train which can operate at 100 miles an hour, which was previously not our planning assumption. So this is changing quite rapidly. Um, but I think over the course of the next 12 months, we're going to have to make some firm decisions um, rather than put our hope on, you know, battery ranges, for example, changing materially, um, because we need to crack on with it and continue this programme of decarbonisation, which we've delivered so successfully um, in the last few years. And, you know, look at the way we transformed the electric services in the central belt with Britain's most reliable new trains, loads more capacity, we've cut journey time, we've improved customer staff. Uh, we're looking forward to you know, doing that with other parts of the network as well. Okay, many thanks indeed for that. Thank you, Kamina. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm actually going to try and bring Emma Harper back in, um, not to ask the same question, because I'm afraid you'll have to check the answer on the official record. But if you want a supplementary to where you were going on that, Emma, now's your chance. Thanks, convener. Apologies, I had to restart everything, and uh, I will check the official report for Alex's answer because I completely missed it all. Um, but I, I mean, a wee quick stop, uh, convener. Um, Michael Matheson actually gave us information when he was here recently about um, um, progress towards decarbonising uh, the southwest, for instance, so between Stranraer and Air, and he talked about. Uh, battery power and hydrogen power. So I'm just wondering if any progress has been made with, with that line in particular, because there seems to be in our col colourful map complete lack of rail infrastructure, let alone decarbonising the rail infrastructure in the southwest of Scotland. So 
I'm wondering if any progress has been made or any plans for um, for a better connectivity in the future for the southwest. Mm. So the two issues there. One is in terms of decarbonising the rail network in the southwest of Scotland. The plans are as they are set out in that July document which Transport Scotland published. Um, so nothing has changed there uh, in the last few months. In terms of generally plans for rail investment in the southwest of Scotland, uh, clearly we've you know made uh, improvements in recent years. For example, Dumfries to Carlisle, where we doubled the frequency of train service, and we recognise there's a clamour for better rail services in the southwest of Scotland, and Transport Scotland are looking at that. Uh, as part of one of their regional studies into transport in the whole region, of which rail will be an important mix. Um, so, um, yes, the southwest of Scotland will get its share of the investment as we decarbonise the railway. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thanks, uh, convener. I'm sure um, building a bridge to Ireland won't be on the top of the priority list. I'd rather see um, <laughs> <laughs> a, a nice try, Emma. Um, um, I think your link, I think your link's broken again. Right. So we're going to move on to the next question, uh, for, which is from Angus Whitlock. Angus, good morning. Okay. Thanks, um, convener, and good morning to the the panel. Um, with regard to the Leavenmouth rail link, which uh, got a, a brief mention earlier, uh, I'm sure we were all uh, delighted to hear. Uh, Last August, uh, the Scottish Government announced that the uh, five miles of abandoned railway between the uh, Thornton North Junction uh, on the Fife Circle and Leaven would be rebuilt and reopened. So, can um, can we get an update, please, uh, with regard to um, the development of the Leaven Mouth Rail Link, including a, uh, an outline of the, the the project timetable and also the expected costs? Yes, of course. So we're making brilliant progress on the reopening of the railway in Leavenmouth, uh, the Leavenmouth Reconnected Project, as we call it. Uh, and on the Scotland's Railway website, uh, the public can go into uh, the project portal and see all the information. On that, clear, we're having to do all our consultation online with the current pandemic. So um, we are clearing the vegetation. We're doing ground investigation work, site investigation work. We are uh, doing the fine detail of the planning, making sure we get the siting of the stations correct. Uh, you know, I would dearly love to see uh, train services running uh, for December uh, 2023, if at all possible. We also need to think about how we decarbonise uh, the Leaven Mouth branch as well. Um, so, it, at some point, we will need to electrify it, and we're just working through fine detail of that. Uh, and the overall project cost is in the region of about £75 million, but that won't be confirmed until we've made final decisions on things like the siting of stations, uh, infrastructure, rolling stock, for example. Uh, but it's green for go on Lever Mouth, and we're really excited about it. OK, that's good news. Good news, convener. Um, I have nothing more to, to add or to ask. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Angus. Uh, now, uh, Jamie Halcrow Johnson, I, I think you've got some uh, questions that you'd like to ask now. Jamie. I do. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, a couple of, kind of first questions. Um, firstly, the Glasgow Queen Street um, development has obviously been very high profile. I was wondering if you could give us an update on that and um, when you expect that to be finished. And also, you've, you've touched slightly on the Inverness to um, Tain side a bit, but just to get an update, um, uh, sorry, um, on my concerns of Highland side, but just to get an update on the wider Highland mainline um, and uh, Aberdeen to Inverness project, how they tie in with the electrification decarbonisation action yeah. plan. Yeah, sure. So um, thank you, Jamie. Um, so first on Glasgow Queen Street. The £120 million redevelopment of that station. Uh, we're nearly finished. And the reason why we're not quite finished is because we had to suspend uh, the construction work during lockdown one because non essential construction uh, was stopped. 
um, but we are on site literally doing the final bits of the uh, scope. So uh, we are weeks away from the end of Queen Street redevelopment, unless non-essential construction is stopped as part of the pandemic. And it was really pleasing to see, you'll remember a few years ago, um, Transport Focus uh, determined that Queen, Glasgow Queen Street was literally a building site. That was because it was a building site. And recently, Queen Street won an award for being the best train station in Britain. So we've literally gone from being the worst station in Britain to the best. And we can't wait to officially open it, uh, socially distanced, of course, in the, in the coming months. Uh, and I don't think that's just a railway project. It marks the end of Edinburgh Glasgow improvement and new trains electrification. But it will spot, it's already sparking off the redevelopment of that bit of Glasgow, and, and we're very proud of it. In terms of um, the Aberdeen to Inverness project, the £330 million investment there, that's finished. That's supported increased services in the northeast. And uh, in the autumn, we opened Kintour Station as well, reconnecting that uh, town to the rail network after 56 years. And as part of our decarbonisation programme, uh, the current plan is that we will continuously electrify uh, the network between the Central Belt and Aberdeen uh, by 2035. Uh, the same for the Highland Mainline Central Belt to Inverness. Um, and we're still working through the detail, but we think the electrification of Aberdeen to Inverness will come after 2035. So we might have to look at some hybrid technology to decarbonise the Aberdeen to an S line um, uh, beyond 2035. So the objective is to decarbonise the whole network by 2035. That doesn't necessarily mean we will have electrified the whole network by 2035 because we're looking at battery electric options, for example. Um, thanks, thanks for that, Alex. Um, just a couple of um, kind of follow ups to that then. Um, in terms of uh, you, you, uh, you mentioned to um, Edward Mountain earlier that you know the obviously the increased costs of running the service um, and potentially delays in passenger numbers in, in, in you know improving or getting back to anywhere near normal levels. So, I mean, are you confident that that, given the need for extra investment in Scotland's railways, probably by the government, are you confident that that won't lead to future investment um, in projects being curtailed, or is that a conversation um, still to be had with the Scottish government? And also, just on the point that you made earlier uh, uh, to me, um, obviously there were delays to Glasgow well, Queen Street because of COVID and non-essential work, and that's understandable. But has that impacted on any other kind of projects anywhere else? I recognise maintenance will, will have likely have been kind of covered, but has, has that entailed uh, any other, or caused problems for any other um, uh, investments anywhere else in the network? Yeah. So. Um... The first thing to say is that the decarbonisation action plan was published in July, i.e. post-pandemic. So this is a Scottish government in commitment to investing in the network uh, to decarbonise it after coronavirus, uh, which is pleasing to see. Um, I, I can't see a future for Scotland post-pandemic where the railway isn't at the heart of our economic and green recovery. Uh, but nor are we complacent about that, and we recognise that we need to change and adapt and make sure that we're efficient, because at some point the economic cost of uh, coronavirus will have to be will have to be met. Um, you're right. The, the two primary projects which were affected by lockdown one and non-essential construction being suspended were Queen Street Station and Kintour, which is why they opened uh, slash finished a little bit later than we anticipated. At the moment, non-essential construction uh, is allowed. So things like leave and mouth are, are, are uh, you know, that's, that's proceeding as, as per plan. In terms of uh, maintenance and renewal, um, we are classed as critical national infrastructure and therefore as classed as essential. And uh, Liam, who's the route director of Network Rail in Scotland, has been, uh, you know, working very hard to make sure that throughout the pandemic, we're managing the risk to our people, but we're also making sure those works which are essential to run a railway safely and reliably. Liam, I don't know whether you want to come in at this point and just very briefly outline the steps we've been taking there. Yes, thanks, Alex, and uh, good morning, good morning, committee. Um, 
at the very start of the pandemic, we identified that a lot of our work fell in the in the category of essential, but um, in order to protect our people who are carrying out that work, um, it was essential that we adjust our practices. So we started back in March and, and in April engaging with the trade unions on all of our activities, all of our maintenance activities, to work out how we could do every single item, because it's all essential to keep the railway running, um, in a in a way that was ensuring social distance for our, our colleagues. So just to give you an example of some things like that, we would ordinarily send a team of maybe four to six people to a site to undertake some work in a crew van. Well, they're all very in very close and close quarters, so we brought in additional vehicles to allow everybody to, to drive separately to site. And then whilst on site, there's obviously a lot of activities that require very, very close contact. So we had to redesign some of them and, uh, and to make sure that we could do it with, with the social distancing measures in mind. We did all of that. We agreed it all with the trade unions, and we've been able, to, therefore, to carry on maintenance and renewal activity throughout the pandemic and without any adverse impact on on the on the service. And we continue to meet the trade unions um, on a um, on a weekly basis to make sure that they continue to be happy with the way in which things are doing, that their members are kept safe, and um, obviously, from our perspective, that we're able to continue that work. So we've not seen any disruption to our ability to undertake maintenance or renewals as yet, which is which I think is very positive. We will of course keep an eye on we do keep an eye on infection rates in particular um, to see whether we have a spike of infections for a particular depot that might affect our production. Um, but uh, we, we we're encouraging our people to follow all of the guidelines whilst at work and also whilst out of work to make sure those critical infrastructure activities are not affected. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, convener, and thank you to Liam and uh, Alex for those answers. Okay, uh, Jamie, if that's you finished, there are some uh, short follow-up questions from various members of the committee. Um, uh, Going to go to Maureen Watt to start with, and then Emma Harper. So, uh, Deputy Convener, what have you got? <laughs> um, thank you, convener. Um, it was just you know we already spoke about the uh, the uh, Williams review and the. Uh, white paper that we're expecting. Being in the industry, I wondered if you had any intel uh, in terms of when we could uh, expect that, because I understand that it would have to be reviewed in light of um, COVID and also um, climate change targets. But I just wondered if you had any idea when we can expect to hear anything more. Alex. Well, Without speculating, the only thing that I know is what's on the record, which is Chris Heaton Harris, who's the Rail Minister at Westminster, uh, who in December said he hoped to see it published by in the next six weeks, which took us till the end of January. Whether we do or not is another matter. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, UK government has its hands full managing the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and whilst the structure of the railways is very important, um, you know, we're in the middle of a national emergency. So whether we see it by the end of the month uh, or not is another matter. So the honest answer is I don't know. Okay, and just uh, one other uh, one. Oh, two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, it's just on uh, HS2. I wonder if there's any update on HS2 and whether there will be, do you think, uh, or has there been any discussion about? You know, more rapid rollout to further north. Of course, the HS2 is happening. It's under construction. Uh, you know, tunnelling is underway uh, in the Chilterns, and um, you know, it's a project which we we support. Um, and one of the things that Transport Scotland is looking at is um, how uh, Scotland might spend any barnet consequentials which are arising from HS2. But obviously HS2 uh, is, is an expensive project. Uh, it's a big transformational project. It will improve, it will bring high speed to Scotland. Um, but barnet consequentials may flow to Scottish Government as well. And so um, there is work underway on some you know very long term plans to see what could we do between Edinburgh and the border and between Glasgow and the border to speed up uh, services uh, to improve capacity. 
Um, so, for example, you know, uh, do we do we need a new alignment of the railway between the border and Edinburgh Waverley, one which is a bit more direct rather than around the coast? Um, between Glasgow and the border, it's primarily a two-track railway, which means we have freight and local services and intercity services all trying to use the same track. Could we add more four tracks in that bit of the network so we are able to speed up intercity services uh, whilst also delivering great local services? So these are some of the very long-term plans uh, we're looking at. Um, but yeah, they're, they're much further into the future. I think our focus right now is, um, you know, on recovering that revenue, decarbonising our our network. But clearly, you know, we've got an eye to cross-border transport developments as well. Thank you. Okay. Th thanks, Maureen. Uh, Emma Harper. Um, Emma. Thanks, convener. Hopefully, my network will um, stick with my question this time. Um, on the back of uh, uh, Maureen's question, I guess um, Sir Peter Hendy is conducting a review of connectivity across the United Kingdom. So, and the High Speed Rail Group um, outlined seven projects that they think should be uh, put on the to-do list. So, I'm wondering if uh, if Scott Rail have been asked, or have you? fed into this review and and would we ultimately want the UK government to pay for any m massive infrastructure uh, improvements uh, if we are going to see uh, connectivity across the UK improve? So we have engaged with the Union Connectivity Review um, and both directly with Sir Peter, uh, who is the chairman of Network Rail, of course. Uh, and through the CBI, who we work very closely with here in, in Scotland. Uh, and I saw uh, High Speed Rail's proposals, you know, I uh, read those with interest. So, um, yes, we're taking part to advise and assist, uh, but as you know uh, better than anybody, you know, this will be a decision between UK and Scottish governments. Um, we're there in an advisory uh, uh, capacity. Uh, rather than a decision-making one, uh, and we look forward to seeing the output of that review when it's published. Okay. Thanks, uh, Alex, and thanks, Emma. Uh, Colin Smith, I think you've got a question now. Hey, thanks, Convener. Um, we, we've discussed quite a lot, obviously, about reductions in services during the, the pandemic, and a new ScotRail timetable came into effect on the 13th of December, which, which we saw significant reductions uh, in services. Now, we anticipated that was likely to be the timetable that would take us uh, to hopefully some sort of upturn in passenger numbers in, in, in several months' time. But in the last few days, there has been, I think, almost out of the blue, further cuts in services, namely between Glasgow and Stranraer. So could I ask, is that just a very short-term reduction in service, or is that now part of the revised timetable? And are there plans to reduce any other services that we don't know about? So we are actively considering further reductions to the train service because demand has fallen back to 10% of normal. Um, so that is something that we're literally working on at the moment. Is there an opportunity to operate shorter trains uh, and still provide space for physical distancing? And is there an opp opportunity to operate fewer train services? So at the moment, we're operating about 80% of the train services for about 10% of the demand, which is not good value for money for the taxpayer. So further train service reductions are under consideration. Um, the specific example you refer to in terms of the Southwest, um, those timetable changes we've had to make recently actually go back to the timetable we're operating in, in the summer. And um, as well as passenger demand and space for physical distancing, uh, and making sure we deliver good value for, money for taxpayers. In some pockets of the network, we need to tweak the timetable to make sure we can resource it properly. And in the southwest of uh, Scotland, we have quite a lot of manual signal boxes. And so, because we have a relatively high number of our people there shielding uh, because of coronavirus, we've had to change. Um, uh, signal box opening times, which has affected the timetable. So that's the background behind these latest uh, changes in the southwest. But 
yes, operating fewer services and shorter trains is under active consideration because 90% of our passenger usage has vanished because of the coronavirus restrictions. Thank you, Colin and Alex. Uh, Richard Lyle, um, I think you're getting the last question here. Richard. Thank you very much, Kandina. Can I, while I have the opportunity, can I ask uh, Liam Sumter uh, regarding weather precautions? Some areas of Scotland have recently experienced uh, snow and very icy conditions in the last few weeks. There are predictions of another beast from the east. So, what steps are Network Rail taking to ensure that uh, points are not frozen and that snowfall doesn't affect our railway? Thank you yeah. for the question, Richard. Um, so, you're, you're quite right. We have had some very cold weather. Last week, the temperatures dropped to uh, minus 15 on some parts of the rail network. Um, and as, as you'll be well familiar, some of our signalling infrastructure, in particular, is um, you know is, from, is Victorian technology that is is not designed to operate in those sorts of conditions. So we have two, or two, I'm going I'm to say two principal areas of uh, of concern. The first is um, points, as I think you, you pointed out there, where the points can become frozen due to just the the volume of snow um, that that can happen around the the moving parts of the infrastructure, or they can become blocked so that they can't move um, freely. Uh, and the second one is manual signalling cables that can just literally become um, frozen because, as I say, it's very very old technology. So for the first for the first type of, uh, of of issue points, we we install point heating at um, every set of points or almost every set of points, and that is special components that when the, the trigger when the when the temperature drops below um, freezing, pretty much it triggers a, a heating element which turns it on and yeah. um, keeps the and keeps the points clear of of snow. Um, they there there is a possibility that they can become overwhelmed. Even that technology, which uh, which helps to prevent um, snow being um, being a problem, they can become overwhelmed in very very heavy snow. And that happened a couple of weeks ago in Lanark, um, where we had I think it was thunder snow, as it was referred to, um, where that just so much snow was dumped in such a short period of time that we couldn't protect it. So what we do in in those circumstances is we send out teams proactively to keep the um, to literally shovel snow out of points as it drops very very quickly, or to use um, technology similar to lift uh, to leaf blowers to to clear clear the points. Critical in getting that right is understanding that the forecast is accurate, that we know where the snow is going to call, going to fall, and that's that's a real challenge for us. Are working through at the moment with MetDesk who provide our weather forecast. On these, the second problem that I referenced is the freezing of signal cables, and that's um, that is a real challenge for us because that is literally a cable that attached to a, a lever in a signal box that runs out all the way to the to the signaling equipment itself. And what we need to do there is apply um, something we call kill frost. It's a, it's, I guess it's a bit like a de-icer that you put on your car in the morning um, across the miles and miles of signaling cables to try and keep them moving freely. So when we get um, notification of, of, of they're likely to be heavy snowfall, we get teams out applying this kill frost in advance to try and keep all the all the equipment moving. Uh, we did see some disruption last week because it was just so so cold. Um, it was un unusually cold. Um, but um, the current forecasts for the next 10 days at least are for temperatures that, that I think will drop to as low as minus five, minus six in some areas, and that's uh, that's very well within the manageable level of temperatures with those additional mitigations that I've, I've articulated. If we do see um, another or a new beast from the east, that will cause us additional challenges, not just those that I've outlined there, but also when very, very large levels of snow accumulate on, at high, high parts of the network, and then um, when it melts, it cascades onto the network, causes a flooding risk, and we have to manage that accordingly, um, and we'll do that by putting in things like speed restrictions to make sure that we keep the railway safe whilst um, whilst the, the the weather subsides. Hopefully, that gives you a flavour of the things that we we do to try and uh, and introduce resilience. That's excellent, Liam, and I compliment your staff and what they do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. I, I think it would be fair to ask Alex uh, to come in if there's anything he wants to add to that regarding the actual operation. Uh, in cold weather for, for stations and, and his services. Alex? Well, I think one thing I would like to say is 
a big part of our performance improvement has actually come from the way we manage the weather. So if you look at uh, our summer performance, 80% uh, better than it was two years ago, because we're investing record amounts in making the network more resilient. We delivered our uh, best or nearly best autumn performance um, because we had our biggest autumn plan ever. Um, what we're doing is we're spending more money uh, on the shop floor of our railway to make it more resilient to the weather which we're now seeing. Uh, and climate change adaption has become a big part of our activity. So obviously it's a network rail responsibility to manage the infrastructure. And in this five year control period uh, uh, window to 2024, we've got 22% more money to spend on the operations, maintenance and renewal of the railway infrastructure. And about a third of that is specifically targeted at making the network more resilient to climate change, which we are seeing. You know, every month it's either the hottest, the wettest, the driest, the coldest. You know, we're becoming less temperate and we need to adjust our railway accordingly. Okay. Thank, thanks for that. And I think that brings us to the end of our questions. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, panel for appearing um, at this committee meeting and giving evidence to us. I'm, I'm sure the committee will further discuss rail services with the Cabinet Secretary when the opportunity arises in the coming week. Just to say to the committee and those watching, uh, our meeting next week uh, will be in the morning and it's an evidence session on the Scottish Government's climate change plan uh, with the UK Committee on Climate Change. And there will also be, um, I think, uh, a substantial amount of subordinate legislation to look at. So thank you all for attending this morning. And that concludes this morning's committee business. And I therefore now close the meeting. Thank you.